Chapter 5. Ship's Rats. Human. What shall we do with a drunken sailor? What shall we do with a drunken sailor? What shall we do with a drunken sailor early in the morning? Way, hey, there she rises. Way, hey, there she rises. Way, hey, there she rises early in the morning. <laughs> a Runaway Chorus Bert Lindsay stepped off a third street car on the far side of the short drawbridge across the China Basin Channel. He slung a sea bag over his shoulder, grasped his suitcase from which he had carefully removed the prep school stickers, and strode off toward Pier 50. The nails in his hiking boots clicked noisily on the rough stone paving. How dark it was. Not a light between Third Street and the docks except a train man's lantern jerking along a line of boxcars. At the end of five minutes, Bert became aware that his suitcase and sea bag were heavy. He almost wished that he had accepted his father's offer to drive him down to the pier. Still, he reflected it wouldn't do for a common sailor to be seen with the president of the company. It might lead to more embarrassing questions. When the boy had trudged ahead almost blindly for ten minutes, the great bulk of the two new steel and concrete warehouses on Pier 50 loomed suddenly out of the darkness. Above them, illumined by a faint glow from below, he could just make out the Queen of Asia's masts and the dusky gray sails furled along her yards. Rounding the corner of the farthest warehouse, Bert saw the source of the glow, a searchlight trained on the bark's gangplank. The whole vessel was bathed in the soft, reflective light. Instinctively, Bert stepped back against the warehouse in the shadow of a flat car, dropped his burdens, and stood gazing at the narrow hull and intricate topworks of the bark. As he watched, he became aware of sounds, a sort of hum from within the vessel, and the low mutter of conversation. Looking more closely, he saw that many men were moving about the bark's deck, close to the shore side, only their heads and shoulders visible above the bulwarks. Occasionally, one stood up on the rail, clinging to the shrouds, and gazed along the pier toward the embarcadero. Bert heard the soft step of a heavy man close behind him and turned just as a pocket flash only a few inches away flared full in his face. What are you doing here? demanded a deep voice, and Bert was reassured by the glint of a policeman's badge back of the light. Just looking at the bark, officer, I'm to sail on her, Bert said. He produced his seaman's card, and the policeman inspected it. You're all right he said. Look at all you want to, but you'll see too much of that boat before you hit Frisco again, or Pat Murphy's an Italian. The policeman's roving eye caught sight of a dark figure slipping over the bark's rail and lowering itself toward the pier a few feet below. The beam from the flashlight that had poked into Bert's face a few moments before framed the figure in a circle of light. Get back there, you louse. The policeman spoke without raising his voice, but the dark figure climbed obediently back and dropped to the deck. What makes you think I'll see too much of the Queen of Asia? Bert queried. You ain't seen your shipmates yet, have you, buddy? You mean those men on deck? Is the crew trying to desert, Mr. Murphy? Crew? The big policeman sighed patiently. You ain't never sailed on a salmon packet before, I can tell that. Nah, it ain't the crew. It's the China gang. Listen. Pat Murphy cocked an ear in the direction of the bark's bowsprit a few feet away, then stepped to the edge of the pier. Bert followed. The flashlight showed the head of a swimmer rounding the cutwater. It was a young negro. The whites of his eyes gleamed large with terror. Keep on coming, snowball the policeman ordered. Right over to the ladder and up. Don't shoot, boss, the swimmer gasped. I was coming. I just fell overboard, boss, and that's the truth. The policeman kept his light on the colored youth till he stumbled onto the pier, then trotted him along the pier by a powerful hand, 
on his dripping coat collar and sent him flying up the gangplank. A moment later, two men stepped to speak to the officer who guarded the gangplank, showed their cards, and went aboard. The light was from above, so that the men's faces were shaded by their hats, but Bert thought that the first man, who carried a small black bag, had a dark beard. That will be the doctor, Bert guessed, with someone to carry his heavy luggage. His guess was at least partially confirmed when the second man quickly returned, walked down the gangplank, and disappeared into the warehouse. Seaman number 28 thought of going aboard his ship, but something held him. From his vantage, there was a fascination about the scene. The beauty of the tall bark, faintly illuminated against the haze. That hum from within her. Men trying to escape. Escape from what? Bert wished that Patrick Murphy, policeman, would return and tell him more about the China gang, which seemed to be colored as well as Chinese. Bert still stood in deep shadow close to the wall of the warehouse. He felt like the spectator of a magnificent show, and that to leave its dark corner and step into the lighted area about the gangplank would be like stepping onto the stage. Once, he thought he heard a footstep toward the shore end of the warehouse, but he could see no one. Pat Murphy was in plain sight, talking with his brother officer who guarded the gangplank. Perhaps he would come back and tell him why the color boy and the man who tried to slip over the side to the pier wanted to escape. Now, Bert was sure there was someone close to him, a cautious step, a man breathing heavily. He could dimly see the man's bulk before him, apparently moving toward the exact spot where he stood. The boy made a slight sound. He could feel a warm, stale-smelling breath on his face as a voice whispered hoarsely, Doc stuff is aboard safe, Q. Shall I go aboard now? Most of the sailors is there. Some impulse made the boy answer, Yes. In a thick whisper. One man's whisper, he knew, sounds very much like another's. All right, Q. The man said, and disappeared into the darkness. Two or three minutes later, Bert saw the man, who had carried the doctor's luggage aboard, emerge from the warehouse, with a sea bag over his shoulder, show his card to the guard, and board the ship. Who in blazes was Q? Bert wondered. And why should there be this mysterious to-do about getting the doctor's stuff aboard? But the return of the friendly policeman reminded the boy of another question that might be more easily answered. Say, Mr. Murphy, he began, why do these fellows in the China gang want to get away? Won't they make trouble if they're forced to go against their wills? Trouble? Them? Nah. They all got white livers if they ain't got white skins. Ships rats, they are. You see, this gang has been aboard three days already, and they're getting some restless. They're always that way until they get out to sea. But didn't they sign on? Bert protested. How can it be made to go if they don't want to go? You sure are green, kid, the police assured him. Some of them signed on because they wanted to go, yeah, or because they didn't know any better, but most of them comes from the city jail. Why should the city feed a lot of bums when the chink contractors need laborers for the canneries? Well, that's the answer. He shot the beam of his flashlight toward the dark figures on deck. A police whistle shrilled a short blast from the direction of the gangplank. A small shape bent forward and running at top speed came rushing down the pier toward them. It brought up with a jerk in the arms of Officer Murphy. In the glare of the flash, Bert saw the pale face of a white boy, a year or two younger than himself. Please let me go, officer, the boy sobbed. They'll kill me. They said they'd cut my throat if I... Nah, kid, they won't hurt ya. There was real sympathy in the policeman's voice. You signed on, didn't you? Yes, but I... But they said... Yeah, I know. They give you a lot of hokum about five months vacation on pay. But it'll be a good trip for you anyhow, kid. See a bit of the world. Maybe make a man of you. Sobbing anew, the boy was led gently back to the gangplank. With a sick feeling in the pit of his stomach, Bert picked up his dunnage and followed. All the romance of the great square rigger, 
all the zest for adventure was gone out of him. He carefully felt his way down the steps at the outer end of the gangplank to the deck and stood for a moment in indecision. A man reeled against him, nearly knocking him down. The Sheer card, he demanded. Sheeman, number 28. He held a flash close to the boy's face, enveloping him in a cloud of alcoholic vapor until in disgust the boy knocked the light aside. The man announced emphatically, You ain't no Sheeman. Use dude. Get off ship. Bert pushed him away and stumbled forward in the shadows of the bulwarks. Never mind the watchman, said a quiet voice close by. He's just drunk. I'll show you where you bunk. I'm the third mate. Bert thanked him and followed. Watch yourself. There's a deckload of piles covered with planks. You're walking on them now and you'll crack your head on a beam if you don't duck. Bert heeded the warning just in time. He went forward crouching, dragging his sea bag over the planks. Aren't we going toward the stern? He asked his guide. I thought seamen bunked in the forecastle. Not in the Queen of Asia, the guide answered. Most of the men bunk in the midship deckhouse. But the bark was built with accommodations for only two watches, like all deep water ships. But the fishermen's union agreement requires three watches in this trade, so twelve men have to bunk in the lazarette. Old Smith's bunking aft. Ask me to send you aft too. They stepped from the plank-covered piles to the deck close to the cabin bulkhead, followed the bulkhead to an iron door near the port side, and paused. The third mate swung the door open, and they stepped over an 18-inch sill into a lighted, white, enameled passageway. Bert had vague memories of having been here when he was a small boy. Before he went away to school, his father had brought him, or had it been Mr. Hargrave? On his right were the mate's staterooms and the wireless room, as the signs over the doors indicated. A passageway opened to his left, to starboard, that would lead to the officer's mess and the captain's quarters beyond. At the end of the long corridor, the third stopped and indicated the open door. You'll find a bunk in there, he said, regarding Bert's face curiously and gazing in mild surprise at his clothes. Ever sail on a windjammer before? he asked suspiciously. Hmm, I thought not. You'll want to get some sea clothes when the slop chest opens. And with that, he was gone. Bert glanced at his hiking boots, khaki trousers, and wool blazer. What was wrong with them? And why get sea clothes from a slop chest? Slop chest somehow suggested a garbage wagon. Oh well. He stepped through the door into an irregularly shaped compartment in the very stern of the vessel, one dim electric light in the center of the ceiling showed him half a dozen double-decked wooden bunks arranged in the shape of the lower half of the letter A. In one bunk, a man snored lustily. The occupant of another tossed and groaned as though in torment. From still another came the slow, rasping breaths of an old man. Would that be Old Smith? And was Old Smith his partner? A taciturn man sitting on a trunk seemed to be oblivious, to both, though he looked up with friendly blue eyes when Bert entered, and nodded briefly. He was smoking a large, finely carved meerschaum pipe, a pipe that, as Bert was to learn, he smoked only during his watch, below, and in fair weather. On deck, or in bad weather, he smoked an even larger pipe, of a cheap clay. That man, Bert decided, would be a friend. Bert selected an upper bunk. The ventilation was uniformly poor and spread out his blankets. For some reason, he felt terribly weary and longed for sleep, sleep and forgetfulness. The moaning seaman had become quiet for a moment. Now he howled afresh. Bert paused as he was about to climb into his bunk and glanced at the blue-eyed man. Is he sick? He asked, pointing at his suffering fellow seaman. Ah ha! he growled between his teeth so as not to disturb the meerschaum. Pig dogs to drink that rotten hooch. Ach, my boy, you and I will leave it alone, no? Bert nodded assent and crawled between his blankets. He turned away from the light and lay still, but sleep was long in coming. The city, his home, seemed a thousand miles away. 
There was only this great steel bark with its strange, unwilling passengers, its drunken crew, and so far just two sober, friendly souls, the third mate and the German with the Meerschaum pipe. The hum from within the vessel, the drone of the many voices, seemed now as sinister as the whirring of a rattlesnake. Countless vivid pictures flashed before his mind, only to give place to others. At last they fell over each other pell-mell. Friendly blue eyes above Meerschaum pipe. A voice saying insistently, You ain't no sheman, get off his ship. A boy sobbing, They'll cut my throat. A big policeman with a pocket flash as large as a battleship's searchlight. A man with a black beard, himself in the water, swimming away from the ship, swimming, 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 while something hauled him back to it, the letters of the alphabet whirling around at a dizzy speed and flying off into space until only the letter Q was left. The pockmarked face of a horrible giant leering at him. Then the whole cinema repeated itself in a different order and with new scenes added. At last, the visions faded, and Bert Lindsay, ordinary seaman, slept peacefully for a few hours of his first night aboard the bark Queen of Asia.